Hey, welcome back to the Cloud Gurus podcast. I'm Michael. I'm joined once again by Will. Hey, Will. How's it going? Doing well. How are you? Not too bad. Uh, excited to be back again this week. And I think I think we have some really cool stuff to talk about this time. So. Yeah, it kind of came out of the, the blue, but it is a, a good topic of discussion. Um, I just cracked a Celsius. There's a summer edition. Uh, well, let me stop. Have you had Celsius yet? Mike? I was literally going to ask, what in the world are you talking about? Yeah, I'm going to sound crazy, but for those for those <laughs> who are listening who have had Celsius, they get it. It is an energy drink with, with some great marketing, uh, which I can appreciate, you know, working mm-hmm. in marketing. You know, they say there's no fructose, there's no additional sugar, there's nothing crazy bad about it. And it's got just a lot of caffeine. It's really good. It's it's definitely my guilty pleasure post having a newborn. And I've not been able to shake the once a day Celsius. Like I had my morning coffee. So I got your typical dose okay. of caffeine. But you needed more. I need a lift. Especially if we're going to have a great conversation, you know, for the next hour. You know, I just got to have that little boost. So I usually don't drink all of them because I don't want to like have the shakes or anything, but it's got. Um, well, how big are they? Uh, It's like a tip. I would say it's right around what a, a Red Bull or something would be. Maybe a little bit bigger. Okay. That's manageable. And they've got this, they've got this angle where they talk about how there's like vitamins in it. And there was this huge study that a university did around how it's good for, for like burning body fat and energizing and it's good for prior to like fitness and workout so that that's their angle. I don't know how true that is, but I'm certainly not. Well, it I, sounds like it's got enough caffeine that it's going to force you to do all of that workout. <laughs> Probably. And I mean, listen, I'm, I'm a runner, but I'm not, I'm drinking this. I'm not about to go on a run. So I don't really know that that even matters right now. Anyway, right, well, if you get a little too amped, I'll let you know. Yeah. You'll tell, you'll tell me to calm down and, <laughs> and back away from the microphone. But yeah, so I got my Celsius behind a rock. Excellent. I mean, you're going to need the energy this month because I, I we talked about it last week, but I figured we should bring it up again, right? You're going to be at FinOps X in what, a week and a half at this point? Yeah. Two weeks? Let's, let's hope they've got Celsius in Southern California. I'm sure they do. Uh, yes, we are going to FinOps X and it just, we couldn't be more excited. It's starting to really ramp up in that direction. It's the final, you know how it is if you've ever been to an event. It's just kind of the final odds and ends that we're planning for, but a lot to look forward to. You know, for those of you who will be in attendance, and I say that because I believe they've sold out. I think passes are completely sold out, which is shocking and also very exciting. It means it's going to be a, a great event. But for those of you who are, are joining, we're going to have a booth. We'll be in the vendor section. And during the vendor showcase, which will happen, I, I believe, on Thursday during lunch, and it's a very popular virtual session that the FinOps Foundation does and and typically has a lot of attendance uh, on that on that Zoom meetup. Probably will be a pretty packed room for, for the one that's in person. We're going to have a couple minutes to showcase uh, our products and, and some of the stuff we're very excited about in the Cloud Vault platform. And we'll also be discussing, I think I had mentioned this last time, Mike, we, we have finalized our industry insights research on the real state of FinOps. I spent a lot of cycles in the last week or so just looking through the results and, and thinking about what we've learned. And I got to tell you, I mean, I, I can't preview too much here because we, we obviously want to have it prepared and ready, but there's a lot to take away from this research. I mean, it's actually exciting. I've been in the world of FinOps for years now. And I think it's a, it's a very, it, from a moment perspective and in timing perspective, this research is really relevant for those practitioners out there because it talks a lot about you know, how FinOps is very established at this point and really in the, I would say it's you know, omnipresent in, in most businesses, but there's still a lot of question marks. You know, there's still a lot of like, how do we get this right? right. How do we find an ROI? What does the next two to three years look like? And, you know, FinOps has a seat at the table. Can it deliver is really the big question. So can't wait to preview that. Can't wait to show it to everybody in person and, and have that distributed. That's going to be really fun to share. Like, I, I know neither of us can really get into the specifics, but I think it's safe to say there's going to be some surprises. Yeah, it, there are. And it's, I hope that it is insightful enough for those IT leaders and those practitioners to just think about 
okay, like, well, how are we thinking long term about this? Because yeah, it's it's a, well, it's the start of a. It, we're at the very beginning of a very long conversation. That's when right. it comes to FinOps. That's right. And we I think that cross yeah. the chasm of you know this being an idea and a thought to now it's a staple, but with that comes tremendous pressure. Well, I'm excited to talk more about it. I'm sure we'll, in addition to talking about it at FinOpsX, you and I will probably want to dive into it at least once, if not go into a few different aspects of it once we're sort of ready to share. But I think I'm still digesting from what I've seen of the research. And yeah, no, it's it's going to be really cool to see it come together and, and looking forward to sharing it with every everybody listening. Yeah, looking forward to it as well. But I would say that's, you know, that's kind of the the housekeeping stuff is, you know, if anybody's out in FinOps, please reach out. Feel free to feel free to message us. We'd love to find some time. Yep. And then we yeah, we'll link to that in the description of this episode. There's you can find, you know, information on that on the events page of our website as well. Um not to do a really weird segue, but speaking of interesting conversations, um you, by the time this episode posts, we're going to actually have a blog post up on our site. Um, again, link in the, will we'll be in the description that you wrote after, I think an interesting conversation you were sort of telling me about that you had, um, from some feedback we got actually from our previous podcasts. Yeah. So I, I don't know that I can use the customer's name, but we, we have a, a customer who's been listening to the podcast and. I know we've been offering it up. If there's anybody that has any questions or, or thoughts on what we could talk about, I think it was the conversation I had with Jason Reinhardt around this decision-making framework, particularly in those moments where you're deciding between, do we go to the public cloud? Do we stay on-prem? Mm -hmm. and, and how should we be thinking about that? Is there a checklist of sorts so the question was asked, what are some of the things you should think through in that decision-making process? And it was a really good question. I've been a part of a lot of those types of conversations in the past. And so I, I took some time and worked with a few people who I know are experts and I, I've got some thoughts and I figured hey, it's a good question. Let's, let's dig into that on today's episode. Yeah, no, that works. And, and you shared with me sort of the draft before it goes live. And I think sort of the, the meat of the blog post is really this checklist you put together of, of, of really the essential questions that need to be asked. And I kind of wanted to run down those. Um, you cover them a little bit in the blog. And again, everyone listening should read it, should build the checklist for themselves. Um, again, give us some feedback on it if there's anything that you would want to add to that. But I kind of wanted to go piece by piece and say, if not, what do you mean by this part of the ch this question more like, can you dive further into what companies should be looking for? Absolutely. So I think, yeah. So number one on that, on that checklist was pretty straightforward, right? The thing that needs to be taken into account are, are the business goals, right? The main questions being, you know, what are the business objectives for the project that's being driven? How does the current infrastructure impede these business objectives? Um, where does like obviously that there that's I think the obvious one that business goals should play an important role, but let's dive into the, that a little bit more beyond the surface level. What does that mean to you? Yeah, well, like I kind of made a joke with Jason when we were talking, and it's something that's kind of reoccurring in my mind that as a vendor and as a solution provider, I've always been asked by pros you know prospective customers to build this rock solid return on investment model and total cost of ownership and, and help them understand that the criteria for the business value before any any mature enterprise will, you know, essentially strike a, a deal or, or become a customer. And yet it's so rare that those types of conversations happen in organizations when there's internal conversations around a new service or a new application or a new resource even that's being introduced. A lot of times it's it's very in the simplest form, hey, you have a cost center, you have a budget, just you make the decisions on behalf of your own team or your own business unit. And what I'm suggesting here is the first question you should start with when you're thinking about where should this be deployed is should this be deployed, period, right? And if it is going to be deployed, what is the goal of this application or service or resource? 
how are we planning on quantifying the ROI? And you can think about those metrics in a bunch of different ways. You know, examples could be, is there a monetary outcome for this new application or this new resource? Is it tied to uh, operational processes that we have in the business? What are the ROI models for those, you know, those parts of our business? And sometimes it connects to revenue, but you shouldn't shy away from other examples like linking ROI to, you know, the customer experience, the employee experience using metrics like NPS or CSAT uh, or any other number of like efficiency scores, comparisons versus the old, you know, old way versus new way comparisons, whatever it is. But if you don't really understand what you're trying to achieve and what the business is going to stand to benefit, you really can't have any of the, you can't factor any of the next few questions that we're going to go through. So Right. Well, it's, it's kind of the classic, like, hey, you might have a lot of great ideas, but if you can't tie it back to any of the main objectives that you're, that either your department or your business is actually trying to go for, it, is it worth doing at this point in time? That's absolutely right. And oftentimes what you'll find is the business value and the ROI and all of that will be a good leading indicator of where you should deploy. And, and I, we can get into that more in, in the subsequent questions, but if you're expecting this to be a return on investment from a customer experience perspective, well, that's going to play into a bunch of other questions that we're going to go through. Yeah. And I have to know that at the onset, if that makes sense. Right. So now that that's been established, right, we can, let's move on to some of those other questions. So number two on the checklist is, is, taking into account sort of performance requirements. Um, and I feel like even more so than business objectives, that's this gets very, very specific to the organization, to the department within the organization. Um, but what are some of the things that companies should be looking for, for from that perspective, right? The performance requirements involved. I think even just as a baseline, what is the proposed architecture? What is the recommended architecture for this new service? Um, are there components in this architecture that require, you know, technologies that are not available on prem? Mm -hmm. um, and if it's, if, if not, if you don't have those technologies on premise, um, could you refactor? Well, it changes what you can do. Yeah. Can you refactor the application to potentially work on prem? And, and let me give an example right. of that, right? Oftentimes you might work with a, a COTS application, you know, some commercial solution that an external vendor solution provider is, is, is suggesting or proposing, and they might have a, an architecture diagram that they use, and it's just one of those rinse and repeat blueprints. It's not necessarily built for your organization. It's just their standard that they'll show you. And we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but you can't just take that at face value. And so what I mean by that is, you know, if they're proposing that you use some sort of cloud native resource set, they have their own reasons for that, their own selfish reasons in a lot of instances for that. Is it possible for you to rethink that architecture to have some or all of the components on premise if it's a better value proposition for your business? And uh, I think too often there's not a lot of challenging happening there. And then beyond that, you know, once you understand the architecture, which I, I got to be honest, Mike, not a lot of companies actually physically build an architectural diagram for most proposed no. solutions, and they should be doing that. But, you know, starting with that as your, I guess, your map, what are the performance requirements of the, you know, the end service? And are there important components, whether that's latency throughput, you know, CPU bursting, you know, maybe it's temporary storage, all the typical, uh, you know, performance indicators or, or components, like, can you achieve those on-prem? You should have a good indication of that based on where you're thinking about posting this or publishing this. And if not, are the cloud offerings, the public cloud offerings, you know, do they meet or exceed those? Right. And, and understanding that and customers will always ask, well, what if we don't know what the performance requirements are, right? It's a new, it's a new service. We've never done it before. We're just, 
or mm-hmm. hearing what we shouldn't be doing based on what we read online or what we're being handed by a vendor, you know, that's where you go back to the conversation around performance testing. You know, have you done um, that that typical kind of like build an application in a dev environment and then run a bunch of performance tests? There's all sorts of solutions and third party tools that can help you simulate load. You should be able to confirm your architecture. And this is a really interesting way of looking at it because what I would say mature organizations are doing is they are taking the proposed architecture, performance testing it, and then modeling out, well, let's try two or three other architectures. What if we didn't use this powerful CPU, we brought it down to another SKU, uh, or we tried this exact architecture on-prem and on the cloud, and let's do a comparative model to go, are we really losing much if we do it on-prem? Or as another example, if we do it in AWS versus Azure, or if we do it in this data center that's a little bit farther away, but we know we've got a better cost model. And if you're not running these models, these performance testing models, you're just not knowing where the best bang for the buck is. And I had to say it's all, it's all comes back to money, but in a lot of cases it does. Um, one, One note on this is, and I alluded to this earlier, vendors and service providers are famous for, you know, pushing specifications that are much more than you actually need, right? And it's it's their performance insurance. If they overbuild, then they won't have as many tickets, right? They won't have as many, right. you know, flare-ups because their product, you know, isn't working or something along those lines. Like there might be a software issue that they just try to, you know, kind of overbuild around it and you have to be able to, as a company, kind of roll up your sleeves and use your own testing methods to confirm what these other vendors and these other providers are, are asking you to do. Because if not, it's not to say that the that these providers are making necessarily like a bad or substandard product, so much as every environment is different, and it's really important to just make sure that what you what you're building makes sense for you. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think we all know from even days of old, like the minimum requirements that you see oftentimes aren't even the minimum. You can go far lower than what you see on a package. So you have to think about it in that way. And I I would say what you will start to find, and certainly we've seen this with our customers, is that if your on-premise operation is a better cost model, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, depending on the scenario. But a lot of times what, what you think at the onset, like what you think initially has to be in the cloud, Oftentimes you can do a couple things to change that and and you can be running on premise just fine. So one of the things you said, not to walk it back too much, is that at the end of the day, once you get those things sorted out, right, you know what the business objectives are, you know what the performance requirements are going to be both for the software and for yourself, it then comes down to cost. And that is number, not to jump ahead maybe too quickly, but that is number three on the checklist is the cost considerations. Yep. This is a tricky one. It's a really tricky one because, you know, one, the the data center in a lot of ways has been paid off uh, or at least the investment has been made uh, other than, you know, there's a lot of operational components, which I think we, we oftentimes forget and don't mention, but You know, understanding the cost implications of on-prem versus the cloud, which you've got plenty of tools out there like cost calculators from the providers, but they tell a a snapshot story, not a long-term story. And so the, 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 really the, the whole uh, suggestion here is just actually trying to have a cost analysis. It's not going to be perfect, but just working that into your process is enough to where at least you're discussing and reviewing and analyzing. It, certainly when you start to look at, you know, what does this potentially cost on-prem? What does this potentially cost on a public cloud? You're, you're definitely not going to get it right. But having that a part of your process is very important so that at least you're thinking about it and you're taking these considerations uh, into play. And the other thing that a lot of companies don't do a very good job of is... Uh, really understanding the benefits of each component of their cloud fabric. And and what I mean by that is, 
you might have worked out with Amazon a better reservation model for certain resources than Azure. You might have better licensing cost on Azure than you do with AWS for certain technologies. Those are all things you need to factor when you're building something. So those kind of additional financial considerations or constraints even, you need to take those into account. And you can start to build out that total cost of ownership model. And when you see things such as, hey, this is going to be a SQL server and it's a part of the architecture, you might be able to go, well, we know that we have a really good reservation model with Azure and we've got great licensing with Microsoft for SQL when we when we use Azure. So that's a consideration we need to factor when we talk about this. It's not just A versus B. It is totally dependent on the architecture that's being proposed. And so all of those relevant factors, your resource and hosting, your maintenance and operation, your licensing, any commitments you have, all of those things should be factored into that cost consideration when you think about it. And that you know, building out a total cost of ownership, even just as a stake in the ground, is not something I see happening with a lot of companies. So if I'm hearing that right, because I think there's a lot of people who look at cost considerations and that first instinct is, well, I just need to make sure it's not going to cost me too much. It's also about efficiency if I'm distilling down what you're trying to say. Yeah, where you're going to get the ma most bang for your buck. And there's a lot of nuances to that conversation because you're always going to have this, you know, triangle of, you know, what what costs the best, you know, what's the most performance and, and all that. We've heard, we've heard all that before. You have to find that balance. Um, so efficiency is certainly a part of it. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you know you're going to have an application that's not going to be efficient, but the requirements of the business require it to not be all that efficient. So it just depends, but certainly having some sort of process where you are going through a cost calculation is very important. To that end, um, what I guess, there's not a whole lot I guess I can really add to that this part of the conversation, right? I think it's pretty straightforward. It's you got to make sure you can afford what you're spending. You got to make sure that it's, it's if not efficient, it's at least it makes sense what you're spending on. Um, the next, but the next check box on the list is I think a little bit more nebulous. And I kind of wanted to better understand what you meant by um, number four, which is workload characteristics. Yeah. Well, it, it's digging into the architecture a little bit more and, uh, from a resource perspective, but then also thinking about the actual service that's running on top of it. So the application or the service that is being hosted. And, you know, there's that question about, can you host components of this service on premise or in the cloud, depending on, you know, the architecture, but also the value you're looking to achieve. And I'll give you an example of that. So, you know, there are certainly uh, moments where you do need long-term storage. And so you might go, okay, well, we need this workload and this service to be running in the public cloud for whatever reason. And we're going to talk about a few in, in a moment, but we need it in the public cloud. And we certainly need, you know, the first 30 days of storage to be in the public cloud as well. But long-term, we need to hold on to these records for whatever reason, let's just call it compliance or governance or regulation for two years. Well, can we take that storage that's long-term and move it to the, the on-premise data center that we have because we know that's a lower cost? So that's kind of what I mean by understanding the workload characteristics. Um, other things you might think about is like how predictable is your workload? You know, typically if there's a lot of unpredictability in in bursting and in, you know, demand for this resource or application, and on and on, you you want to have flexibility in, in your resources. You want to have modern, more like, you know, uh, PaaS style resources underpinning because they can scale up, scale down, scale out, scale in. And there are a lot of moments where there just is unpredictability. So 
you know, is a pay-as-you-go model more cost-effective than maintaining capacity during these peak loads? Like, are you are you going to run into a place where your on-premise or whatever architecture you choose just can't handle some some load that may come out of nowhere, may, may come out of left field? Um, and even things like, you know, what's the nature of the applications being hosted and, and the data being hosted? Is it stateless? Is it stateful? Is it a combination? Um, do you foresee, again, a need to quickly scale your resources up, down, or out? And if, it, you know, depending on the architecture you choose or where you choose, is that going to be a manual process? Or are there functions such as in a lot of PaaS services in the cloud where that'll happen automatically? And and then another question is like, how rapidly must you and your team uh, react to changes on demand to the actual application or the workload? Are you going to be constantly changing the nature of this application and pushing updates and trying different testing models and taking things online and offline. All of these work, what I would call workload characteristics are very important when you decide where you want to publish this because your processes for pushing updates to your on-prem data center may be different than how you push things to the cloud. You might be more agile on-prem, you might be more agile on the cloud. There might be features in the public cloud that allow you to move quicker or allow you to scale up and scale out and, and, and handle random capacity or unknown capacity at any given time. So those types of characteristics you have to plan for or else you kind of you end up in a place where where you're hosting uh-huh. can get you into trouble. Does that make sense? Right. No, that, yeah, no, you're making total sense. And and I'm wondering too, as as you sort of expand on that, much more than the first three points we, we've talked about so far, this feels like the one that can change the most rapidly. Yes. Um, like in the middle of the process or, or one even after you've launched a process, because you're even talking about, you know, what, what possibilities there are with the, say, the public clouds you're using, that can change every day. So are there ways to sort of keep on top of that, right? To recognize, hey, we've made a change with our within our own business processes. Maybe we've added a new person to the team. Maybe we've lost a person from the team. Maybe the maybe the skill level has changed over time, right? You, you, there's a lot of ways that this can, I think, be adjusted. And I'm wondering if there's maybe a process of regular check-ins with the team involved, with the, with the, the tools involved as well, just to make sure, hey, are we actually, are we still doing this right? Have the workload characteristics changed? Or is it just kind of you take it as you come? Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, what, what we're talking about right now, Mike, is this proactive conversation that happens before you deploy. And what you're alluding to, I think, is a very important topic. A little bit is, after that, yeah. Yeah, which is which is how do we then, okay, we have an assumption in the beginning mm-hmm. and we take all the information across all these checklist items, if you want to call them that, and we made a calculated choice okay, we can't just trust that choice into infinity. We have to go back and you know, check our assumptions and verify that what we thought was going to be the case actually is the case. And so introducing mechanisms or processes where, you know, one, you've got a cadenced uh, milestone or, or ritual around going back and, and going, you know, did we make the right choice? And how do we think about that? Do we run it against the same checklist? Who do we work with to understand that? It's probably your INO teams or your operational teams just to, to see if, hey, the performance is there, the cost is there, all these things. Uh, but then, you know, beyond just the cadenced moments, do you have channels within the business where escalations can happen? So if operations finds out within the first couple of weeks that, oh man, we deployed this into the cloud and it's costing us a ton of money, what does that feedback loop look like? And how does that then change your calculation for the future? I think is what you're alluding to, Mike. And it's important because yeah. if if a FinOps team goes, well, hey, this is the first time we've used Cosmos DB because this, you know, this COTS application required it. And boy, we had no idea how to manage this from a cost perspective. Well, now that needs to go back into that conversation the next time it's brought up. Right. So more to talk about on that. And I think maybe that, you know, maybe we should have a conversation around the technology fly and no fly list and, and things like that, because it's it's another topic of discussions related to this, but could probably be its own podcast in itself. I was going to say that it's, it's, that's definitely a separate deep dive. I, like 
uh, frankly, we probably could do an episode on every single one of these. That's right. Um, to varying degrees, but I, I, I agree. That's that's a really that's really fertile ground, and I, I'm, I think we should write that one down and, and definitely come back to it, especially if we, if you know the listen if the listeners find themselves really interested. Uh, the next box to check off on the list that you provided, I think, is another hot button issue um, that we've touched on a little bit in older episodes of this podcast, but I think definitely deserves its own really series, like how we like what we've been doing when it comes to to data center. But it's data security and compliance, right? Now, obviously, there's some overlap there, but w- again, every organization is different. But what are some of the main things that should be taken into account? Yeah, and, and this is a pretty straightforward one. What are your data security yeah. needs? Can yep. the public cloud offerings meet these in your current configuration? Um, are there regulatory or compliance requirements, you know, your GDPR, your HIPAA, your PCI, DSS? Do any of those requirements influence your decision? And you know, there's there's a lot of questions around, you know, what is the most compliant avenue? most secure avenue in current state may not be on-prem a lot of in a lot of ways it, it usually is because it's just uh, anti, you know it's, it's easy historic and, and yeah well and it's been around for a while and typically right. security and network teams and all, all those teams have that kind of uh, locked in the perimeter secure all, all that stuff no pun intended yeah right and <laughs> i i would I, I would say that there's a lot more to think about just beyond, you know, where are we, where is the best place for compliance and security? Because that's not the easiest thing to answer anymore. There's also what types of monitoring do we have in place? What kinds of um, auditing procedures do we have? Are there technologies that we use maybe in a cloud that make that easier, right? I know Azure and AWS and Google have introduced a lot of really cool functionality around auditing and monitoring of security and compliance, the, po- the popular ones for sure, and visibility and, and things like, you know, having almost like a dashboard or a console where you can go as a security team, engage with potential cyber threats or potential, you know, breaks in your in your network uh, fabric and, and all of that. So I don't think it's necessarily just a decision around where is this the easiest to be secure? Where is it the most secure? Where is it the most compliant? Certainly that's important, but you should know that pretty well at this point. And I would assume all the clouds you're operating in, you know, you, you should have some sort of posture across all these things if they're important to your business. You know. But that kind of goes back to the nature of the workload. It's also like what is being stored or pulled in from this application? And is it sensitive information? Where does that get routed? Where does it need to get routed? What's the retention policy? Uh, all of these things. And I would say it's it's not so simple as to just on-prem in the cloud. There's a lot more to think about there. And it's certainly case by case, but it has to be an input into that decision process. And it's one of those ones where you go, this decision process can't just happen from your DevOps team and your and your CICD teams. It has to have some sort of security and compliance team member also going, well, no, there's there's a couple things here that do make us pause and we should think about, does this make the most sense in this public cloud for reasons X, Y, and Z? Yeah. No, that makes for sure. Um, and And... I don't really have a whole lot to add. Like you said at, at the top, I think that's a very straightforward one, as is, I think, the next one, which is disaster recovery and business continuity. Um, it, honestly, that is a thing that's been talked to death for a long time at this point, that it's just not just how integral it is, but the different processes that should be in place for, for DR. But I was wondering if you had anything you wanted to add in terms of this conversation. I mean, I've got a lot of battle scars on this one. I, I would say, yeah, it is straightforward. What is your current disaster recovery plan? What's required for this workload? You know, what's the business continuity plan? What's required for this workload? What uh, level of time loss and data loss and performance loss and uptime loss? You know, like what can you pallet as a business for this individual workload? all questions you're probably asking when you think about DR and business continuity to recovery time objectives, your recovery point object- objectives, all of that. 
One consideration that I would throw out there, and certainly those who have operated in the public cloud understand this very well, if you are considering the public cloud for DR, whether that's public cloud to public cloud disaster recovery or on-prem to public cloud disaster recovery, there is a huge cost implication to that. And they're hidden cost drivers. So, you know, even just like the networking and bandwidth of moving the data costs you money. I mean, everything's metered in the public cloud. So you you have to consider that. We've had instances, I say we, I, I've had instances in my past life when I was in cloud consulting where there was a, an Oracle solution, a very large Oracle solution that was handling a massive amount of data change every minute. And the disaster recovery plan that was put in place to the public cloud, there wasn't a realization at the onset that the transmission of this data from one region to the other, the ingress and the egress was going to cost so much because the the, the technology solution in, in Azure was trying to keep up with the change that was happening so fast that the amount of data that was getting pushed and pulled was just so high that the, the bill was astounding. It was so, so, so high. And and there was a sticker shock for sure. And we, we learned a lot from that. But that's one of those things that you, you don't really know until you get burned. So you got to think about it. And the other one is, you know, you're paying for resources as they're used in the cloud. So if you have disaster recovery in the public cloud, you might try to save cost by turning off the VM and not spinning up the the disks that are attached to it and not, you know, maybe not having the network live and all of these things. And a part of your disaster recovery plan, you have to then go, you know, turn on the the actual compute instance. You have to attach the disk. You have to maybe build a storage account. You have to do all these things. Well, now all of a sudden your recovery time is not instantaneous. It's not a true failover. It is a react to the the outage, then go work a 20 to 30 step plan in the cloud to get all your resources ready and then fail over. You lose a lot of time and not every workload allows that. Not every business service allows that. So you you kind of are stuck between, do we spend a lot of money all the time as insurance, or do we save a little bit of money understanding that we might lose data, we might have an out, a true outage, and there's going to be a lot of operational and, you know, implications to, to getting this service running again. So, and Mike, I mean, that, I don't know if you've ever, you know, heard those kind of things, but certainly when you think about disaster recovery, it is an easy question. It's maybe a straightforward question, but it's not an easy question. It's, yeah, I was, I was gonna. I was about to say, like, I don't think it's easy, but yeah, there's a lot of yeah. The public cloud is super beneficial because it's it can make for a very quick failover and almost you know no time lost. But the cost that comes with that often is is you, know, you pay for it all the time. So you just gotta be able to know that you have an answer. For it. That's right. Yeah, and, and and what what amount of pain is the business willing to to go through? And that comes back to the business value. There's some applications and services where you cannot afford 30 seconds lost. And then in that case, then you have to kind of balance that against cost and go, okay, well, if that's the case, do we pay in the public cloud for this to kind of always be ready, but we're always paying for it. And I think that's a great example of, of like, we're talking about this as, you know, a checklist where you go one, two, three, four, whatever, but they kind, they all play with each other a little bit. And this one, like like you're bringing up all all the cost considerations, that's a huge deal when it comes to the DR that's in place for whatever you're trying to build. Exactly right. Um, and I think another thing that interplays with cost as well, and I think also probably with the workload considerations, um, especially would be box number seven, which is sort of integration interoperability. So, as, and I'm curious, like, how do you view this differently than workload considerations? Uh, it is a workload consideration. It's also, but it's it's not just this single workload consideration. It's considering all your other workloads. So, so I think that's okay. how it's different uh, in in nature. But uh, this this does come back to a lot of what Jason and I were talking about. And I, I don't want to beat it to death, but you know, you you are 
you're building this architectural diagram for one solution often and you go, okay, well, here's the compute I need, here's the services I need in the cloud, and here's here's the architectural diagram, but zoom out another layer and think about how does this system or this application or this tool fit into the broader technology stack that we have? And what does it need to work really well with? That's important. Sometimes it's like, well, hey, we, you know, we, we want to put it in the public cloud in this data center region because we needed to reach you know, this, this region, you know, A and Z, let's just say, well, for this service to work, it might actually need to be connected to some other service that lives in North America and is on prem. So what do I mean by integration and operability? It's, it's, Hey, what are the connected solutions at play? And are those potentially factors as to where you deploy this? Not every one service is its own thing, right? It has to connect into the fabric mm-hmm. of the business. And so that's a ripple effect. Totally. And so if, if you publish this into the public cloud, but then a, a key part of the success of this new service is another service that's not in the public cloud, are there now latency issues? Are there now uh, transmission issues, storage issues? You know, like you could, I've seen this happen. You publish something in one region you don't factor oh man well hey listen we need to make sure this network connects with this other solution that's so far away that is not in the public cloud now all of a sudden the new service isn't actually working the way it was intended to so i've even seen moments where hey listen it's such a it's such an important factor for this new service to work that we need to rethink our old service and bring that into the public cloud or bring them both on prem because they need to work, they need to be close to each other and they need to work well together. So that's all I mean by that one. Uh, you should have a strategy for you know cloud data management, data integration, migration, um, and also systems integration. What systems does this new system need to play with uh, really well? And, and is that a part of your decision framework? Got it. Okay. Now, and, and that makes a lot more sense why this sort of spins out into its own bullet. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, so moving on to number eight, um, and let me know if I'm rushing along, but I, 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 I do want to like make sure we can at least cover on all of them. Cause there are, I, I should have mentioned this up top. There are nine boxes to check here, but they're all, I would say of equal importance. Um, it's funny that like in my mind, this is something that should be like at the very top, but like I said, it's all kind of equal importance. So it's not like, oh, if you don't have this, it's okay. So much as that's just where it is on the list, but staff skill set is I, I would say very critical. Like there's that question you, that I think a lot of people sometimes forget to ask, which is, this is, this is a great idea. Do we have the actual ability to do it with the people we have? That's right. That's so, it, it is this, if there's one on this list outside of cost where I've seen so many companies burned, it is this one. And, and here's what I mean. One of two things happens, either a new architecture, a bunch of new resources, and not a bunch of novel technologies are introduced and the operations team has no idea how to manage it and how to keep it, you know, up to date and all everything, right? All the operational components that come with it from a resource perspective, from an infrastructure perspective. And now all of a sudden you are on a, a P1 outage at 2 a.m. because, you know, this Kubernetes cluster that nobody knows how to operate in the operations side was built by a dev who understands how to build it and deploy it. Now you got to get that dev on the phone or you got to get that vendor on the phone or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just learning through loss essentially. And I, I would say that that's, it's less of a, I, less of a problem now. I, I think more companies are cautious about, we can't just introduce every new service out there because just because we can develop it and architect it and deploy it doesn't necessarily mean that our operations team has the skill sets and the knowledge to run with it. And by the way, Mike, I should also point out, it's not just point in time knowledge. If you're using a new service, they are changing mm-hmm. so rapidly. They are all the time. If your operations team does not have the bandwidth to keep up with the newest Databricks release, for example, and all of a sudden they push something that's a breaking change to this resource, you're going to have problems in the business. So it's not even just, hey, do you have people that kind of understand Databricks? It's 
it's even beyond that. Like, do you have the cycles to make sure that everybody across your 24 by seven break fix teams and patching teams and all these operational, you know, elements, do they have time to keep up with the changes that are happening right. so rapidly? But that's not even it anymore. Let, let me go a step further. Does okay. your security team know how to keep these new resources secure? Uh, it, that is, that's one example. Do your FinOps teams understand how to manage the cost of these resources? So it is, it's even beyond just I and L. It, it's even beyond the, the infrastructure team. You might have an infrastructure team that's like, okay, we, we know Kubernetes, we're keeping up with the changes. Certainly we see it everywhere, but does your security team have a network architecture that will keep it safe? I, I, so to, to, to distill that down, like, and, and I think now the way you explain it, the placement on the list makes a lot more sense to me, which is, all right, you've checked off these seven things that you need to have. Do we have the personnel with the skill and the bandwidth to keep up with all of those things? Yep, exactly right. And before we launch this. Trust and believe you know, the public cloud providers, they will charge you a lot of money for their oh, yeah. priority support um, to get on at two in the morning to help you out with your, you know, but there's, there's, there's trickle down problems with that as well, Mike. If you've got a, a product that is offline for four hours while you're troubleshooting, that's, a, that's an issue. Uh, and, and usually the stakes are pretty high. You have a new launch in a retail store for this you know, newer marketing play, and it's based on some technology that you just built on some new, you know, new resource type that you've never worked on before. And now all of a sudden you're losing revenue in the stores and mm -hmm. you're, you've got downtime or, or your project timelines get pushed back and that costs more money and you got to extend the vendor. And there's all these other costs, like, I hate to say it all comes back to cost, but it, that's usually the implication the bottom is, line. right. It's not just an outage. It's an outage that has you know drastic effects on the business. So this skill set thing is is interesting because we, those of us who have been in the IT space for a long time, are very used to this cadence kind of cycle of like, okay, we're updating the on-prem infrastructure, we're we're bringing the you know the operating system up to the newest OS after four years, and and you know now we got to think about it from every application perspective, and we got to update everything and make sure nothing breaks, and there's this you know, multi-year process to get things done. And what we have to realize is that things are moving so quickly in the cloud that these newer technologies, they change every week. They've got breaking changes that can get introduced all the time. And your security teams have to keep up. Your FinOps teams have to keep up. Your operations teams have to keep up. Your vendors have to keep up. Everybody has to keep up or else you're putting your company at risk. So you know, we probably spent a long time on this one, but it is very important yep. and it is, no, it is certainly the one that I would, I would say most companies would agree that that's where they've seen a lot of pain. I can completely understand that. And, and I mean, if I can throw in a slightly morbid analogy here, like if you, if you need to get a, like if you have surgery that needs to get done, you could find the best on paper doctor surgeon in the world a doctor can really only be as good as the medical journals they've kept up on, as the conferences they've attended, right? Like they need to still have up-to-date information they're working on, no matter how good their technical ability is. And what we, what you're looking for here is that same thing, right? Everyone in place needs to have the skills to do it on day one and the ability and the bandwidth. And frankly, I honestly, it, it, sometimes it's also just the willingness to do it. Some people just, they don't, that's just not who they are to stay on top of the processes as they move forward. Or if you're not going to have that, just understand that going in and, and build accordingly. That's right. It is, there's a level of, of systems thinking that we are suggesting in this uh, conversation in this article that I want to publish that goes, you have to think beyond just your basic, like, does it fit the requirements and how much does it cost? Right. I mean, there's so many uh, components that you have to factor that, if you don't have an established process, you're, you're going to get into trouble. Yep. So you've gone through this checklist. You, you've checked every box. You've made sure everything is matching the business goals. You have the performance requirements in place. You've, un you've understood the cost considerations. The workload characteristics are understood. You have good data security and compliance. You have good DR. You understand the ripple effects in the integration, and you've checked with the 
the actual manpower involved to ensure that the people in place are going to be able to, to keep this thing going. Not even with all that taken into account, and this is, I think, where we do start to look more into the future than we've hinted up to this point, nothing, again, more of it, sorry, nothing lasts forever. And at some point, I think maybe you will want to transition this platform off of the public cloud, or you'll want to replace it with a different platform. Essentially, what, what you're asking for, what you're recommending with this final checkbox is even before you launch, understand, at least have an idea of what your exit strategy might look like. Even if that might change, you want to you want to know it going in. And, and why is that so critical before launch? Well, right. I mean, the first question is, how long do we need this service in the business? Not every service is built forever. There might be a campaign that's attached to, there might be some sort of initiative that's temporary. There might even be, we bought this license for two years and we're going to try it out. And that's that's how long you know, this needs to be where it's going to be. So how long does the workload and its components need to stay in the cloud you choose? And probably an even more important question is, if we decide we need to transition the workload to a different cloud at some point in time, or you know, bring it back on prem or something along those lines. What would that look like? How much pain would we have if we deploy this right now into the public cloud? How big of a lift is it going to be to bring this back on prem? Using the architecture we're proposing, using using all the things we just talked about, and are we willing to take on that risk? Meaning, if we decide to go with the newest resources that are out there provided by Azure and we decide we're way in over our skis, is it easily going to be able to transition or be refactored to on-prem? And how much do we lose in that process and, and vice versa? So the exit strategy, like thinking about the end in mind is important. And sometimes you don't have an answer as to when the end is going to be, but you can think sure. about what potential ends might be. The end might be we're, we're moving it somewhere else. The end might be we're decommissioning it entirely. The end might be a black box or a question mark. We don't, we don't know. But thinking about that at the onset is very important. And then my recommendation to most IT leaders when I was in the FinOps world is put a tag on this and set a date, set a, a moment in time that you're going to come back and you're going to audit this. Just to see, hey, where are things at? Like pull up that initial architectural diagram, pull up this checklist and the responses that you had, pull up the conversations and perform an analysis on, do we need to continue having this in the business? And is it getting the ROI that we expected? Is it driving the value? All of these things that we've spoken about, but certainly thinking about that exit will help you be more cautious in the, the building process. I, I, again, I don't think I have much to add. I think in a weird way, it's straightforward. It's just, I, it's shocking to me of everything on the list, how little people take this into consideration before they start anything. I mean, I, and I say that like to myself as well, like that's a mistake I know I've made in, in my career and I, I hope to not make again, but you never know. Sometimes you, you rush into a thing and you think you have everything in order and you're not even considering, hey, what if, what if we want to change it up? And having this conversation inserts a level of accountability to everybody involved because it's so easy to, to say, we want to use this cloud and these technologies and you're just having, you know, you're just sending it off, it gets approved. But when you're actually having a full on conversation, having to build a business case, you're putting your brand behind that. And so you're a little bit more cautious yeah. and it's not just your brand it's everybody's brand that's a part of that conversation. I, I would say you know, a lot of us in the world of technology are trying to figure out how to solve this complexity problem and how to solve this waste problem. And it's a cornerstone of the conversations we've been having. This type of suggestion, like what we're talking about today, doesn't solve everything. But if you're not doing it, I guarantee it is a major part of your problem. And 
you know, whether or not it's like top five recommendations from, you know, a Gartner or a FinOps Foundation or whatever, I, I just, I, I don't know how you, you really get past the, the pain if you don't start thinking about things such as this as being like, we need to have a framework for our business where we're asking questions every single time to understand that, you know, what is the ideal choice for each service that we're introducing? And something as simple as just a well-constructed pre-deployment questionnaire that, you know, the devs have to have input to, security has to have input to, FinOps has yep. to have input to, operational leaders have to have input to, and there's some discussion is such a, it's such an easy step, but it can yield really, in my opinion, transformational results if you do it right. Well, to that point, I, I, I don't, I don't know what else we can really say on this other than I think we could dive into each one of these topics. Maybe we should at some point, you know, take a look at some of, some of the more, not important, but some of, some of the, the more expansive ones that are on this checklist um, that sort of have their, like, I, like, again, workload considerations can be its own thing. Um, I would say even like integration interoperability can be its own thing where like you, we can take a look at some of the major tools that people are almost certainly using um, in some combination, both on-prem and in the public cloud. But I don't know, maybe, maybe our listeners will give us different feedback, but I, I feel like we've, we've covered a lot of ground on this today and I, I didn't know what else you wanted to add. Well, I mean, just, I guess probably just as way of a recap. So, you know, we, we've got business goals, we've got performance requirements, cost considerations, workload characteristics, data security and compliance, disaster recovery and business continuity, integration, interoperability, staff skill sets, exit strategy. Those are the nine that I would suggest from a crawl, walk, run perspective, I'll bet if you put this list in front of your experts in your business, they would come up with 30 questions for each of them. That's overkill. It's less about the actual questions and more about the conversation and the process and the established focus on this than it is the actual nuts and bolts of the question. What I think probably my last suggestion would be having something is so much better than nothing having too much now becomes a bottleneck to the agility and speed that you need in, in modern times. And I've seen companies go way far over just the discussion into building this very rigid resource request process that stifles how quickly you can bring things to your business. And so that would probably be my last point just to wrap this up in a bow is this is, you're not going to get a perfect checklist, but these are the considerations and what I would say the business inputs to the discussion that I think are very important. And having that as a, as a cadence and a process is uh, fundamental to achieving success in this multi-cloud world. And a lot of times it just starts with having, you know, a very basic process around uh, or checklist around when do we have a checklist like this in use, right? Like what are the triggers that make us as a group spend the time to have this discussion? You may not need to go through this nine point list for every new service. If it's maybe just a new resource or a new instance of an existing application, maybe it's just for the very important new things, but thinking about that as well is important. So what, what triggers this type of conversation? And don't over-engineer it, I think would be the last thing I would say. Makes sense to me. Well, I mean, obviously, it's like, thank you for sharing this. I, I'm, again, this is, I think by this point that, that you're listening to this, this should be up on our website to read and it'll be linked in the, in the show notes. But, you know, if you have any questions, right, feel free to reach out to us. Obviously, we have a place to respond on Spotify to any of you listening on that platform. Um... Other than that, I guess we'll we'll see you all next week. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining. I'm gonna I cracked about halfway through the Celsius, so I don't know if I should stop, but <laughs> hopefully I wasn't speaking too fast. No, no, you were pretty you were pretty even. I th I think you should just down it. Oh man, well then I really need to go do some sort of like physical activity that they recommend on this thing. I don't I don't know. <laughs> it, it's funny because one of the one of the little logos is somebody doing yoga, and I'm just like, I don't know. 
I don't know how you slammed. I think it's 200 milligrams of yeah, 200 milligrams of, of caffeine, and then sit there in a quiet room with some Zen music playing. I don't think that I don't I don't know if I could do that. Maybe some can, and not not me. I was gonna say weirdly that actually is a thing that I can and have done. Oh, okay, well, different people. Anyway, yeah. like this this was a good one. Thanks, uh, and looking forward to the next few conversations. Absolutely. Talk to you soon. Cheers.